Good afternoon and welcome. I'm Siobhan Brown, MSP, the convener of the Scottish Parliament's cross-party group on towns and town centres. And I'd like to welcome you to the 2022 Festival of Politics organised by the Scottish Parliament. This year, we celebrate the festival's 18th year of provoking, inspiring and informing people of all ages and walks of life to engage in three days of spirited debate. We are delighted that you can enjoy, join us here today and participate on, online for this debate on whose town is it anyway? I would encourage you all to use the question and answer box to introduce yourselves, starting with your first name only and where you are. You can also use that box to pose any questions you would like the panel to respond to. If you're keen to share your thoughts on social media, you can do so by using hashtag FOP2022. So, a recent study by Power to Change shows that 20% of UK high street properties are owned by distant landlords with no interest in local communities. The same study showed that 70% of UK citizens are concerned about the decline of their high streets. With the sheer pace of retail change and these ever increasingly complex ownership structures, what can government, local government and communities do to take back ownership? To answer these questions and more, I'm very pleased to be joined today by an expert panel and let me introduce them. First of all, we have Leslie Riddock, who is an award-winning broadcaster, journalist, author, cyclist, land reform campaigner and a lover of all things Nordic. One of Scotland's best known commentators and broadcasters, she is a weekly columnist for The Scotsman and The National and is a regular contributor to The Guardian, Scotland Tonight, BBC Question Time and any questions. We also have Phil Prentice, who is a Chief Officer of Scotland's Town Partnership with 25 years of economic development experience across public and private sectors. He aims to drive sustainable change through collaboration and partnership and help to deliver the Town Centre Action Plan. We're also joined by Emma McKenzie. Emma is a Head of Asset Management with New River and has a responsibility for the performance of its UK retail portfolio. A qualified chartered surveyor with over 20 years experience in the retail property market. And Emma is also on the UK Government High Street Task Force Board member. And Michaela Sullivan, who is the Head of Service and Development at East Lothian Council and has experience in house building and port industries and on large scale regeneration products. Projects. Michaela has a Master's in Civic Design, an MBA from Manchester Business School, and is a member of the Royal Town Planning Institute. A very warm welcome to everybody this morning. I'm keen to bring in questions and thoughts from the audience, but I'll get us going with a couple of questions first, if I may. Town centres are critical to our culture, our economy, and also our environment. But over the last decades, they have been challenged and lost the nurture that has been needed. Is ownership the key driver in reinvigorating our town centres? Whose town is it anyway, or whose town should it be? And what are our panellists' views as to the biggest challenges facing our town centres over the next 10 years? If I could go to Leslie first, then Phil, then Emma, and finally Michaela. Over to you, Leslie. Uh, thanks very much. I, I would quake a little bit at being described as any kind of expert on this front. Um, and also, uh, I, I do now write for the Herald, sorry to everyone on the East Coast, and they would be miffed if they thought they were the Scotsman. But that all being put to one side, it seems to me, um, and this is now slightly putting my Nordic hat back on again, the biggest problem that still faces town councils is the fact, um, there I've just said it, they're not town councils. That's it. Um, we've got towns that are struggling with all the sorts of different changes that Siobhan just described, some of those ownership structures that sit beneath it, um, funding difficulties, trying to get going, trying to lever in the enormous amounts of energy that its people have in every town and goodwill and desire not to be walking past dereliction all the time. Depressing. Um, and it's not as if people aren't willing to try to do something to help. And yet, most of these towns that we're going to talk about today have no control whatsoever over themselves directly. And that's weird. 
I mean, if I had a, a pound for every time I've had to point this out to people, I'd be wealthy now because Scotland is sitting with the largest so-called local authorities in the developed world, not by a small amount, but by a country mile. Just to give you a wee example, in fact, one wee example that was highlighted in a recent Nordic Horizons event I did um, is with the tiny Faroe Islands. Right, the Faroes, probably nobody's even been there, but there are 18 little islands between Shetland and Iceland. They have a population of 55,000 Pagora. You've, we probably have got towns all over Scotland that are bigger. They have 55,000 people and they have 30 local councils. We have 32 for 5.3 million people. So the recent event we did had the mayor of Vagar on. It's a, a town of 1,000 people. There we are. Would we even call that a town? And that um, it, it has about 20% of income tax is sent straight to that local council. They don't argue. They don't have to beg the larger municipality or the, 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 the government of the pharaohs every year on a different basis. No. As of right, the same thing in Norway, the money goes straight off to those municipalities. And the control that they have allowed them to build an international swimming pool, 1,000 people, because they happen to be lucky enough to have in their midst a brilliant young man who became an Olympic swimming champion. And so, building on his reputation and his home base, they self-built practically a swimming pool. The land was donated to them, um, to the municipal council. They put sweat labour into it. The ladies of the parish were ending up painting the yellow lines on the bottom of the pool before it was filled. And on the basis of that, they have now adapted their entire outlook of their town um, to being about an experience culture, a memories culture. They're building brilliant memories of being a young person and a child in Vagar, because that's what will get their young people back after they've gone on to further education somewhere else. They can do that because they control their town. And they're living on an island that only has about four or five thousand people on it. It wouldn't even make a fraction of a corner of an area committee in the massive desert that is local democracy in Scotland. So that's what we're missing. And everything that flows after this is really trying to deal, I think, with this massive unspoken about difficulty, which is the structure of our local government. Thank you very much, Leslie. Can I bring in Phil, please? I agree with a lot of what Leslie has said in terms of the democratic deficit. Um, we do tend to have much bigger local authorities that are quite distant, and very often they'll focus in on one particular town to the detriment of a lot of others. But going back to the starting uh, precept, Scotland is a nation of towns. We are still a relatively small nation, but towns are really, really significant. You know, in terms of our history, our culture, just wider society, the environment, the economy. So we do have to look at where we are just now and how we actually move forward. And I think a big part of it is the question is who owns or whose town is it anyway? Some of that will be about ownership, but fundamentally it should be does the town work for the people in that town? And what are the mechanisms to make that happen, make the town more relevant? COVID and climate have both provoked a step change in terms of what needs to happen. I think the only way forward will be genuine collaboration where the public sector becomes a facilitator and the, the commercial and social sectors actually work together to um, generate ideas. I'm a big fan of community ownership, but I would urge caution. The current economic construct actually works against communities. And where we have seen communities step up to the plate to, to take on projects, you know, like the cinema project in Campbelltown or in Helensburg or in uh, you know, across the country, where, where development trusts and others have stepped up to the plate, mid staple quarter and the stove down in Dumfries, they have faced massive challenges because the system is rigged against them. And I think the work that was undertaken by Professor Lee Sparks and, and the town centre, um, the, the new future for Scotland's towns, a lot of those fiscal measures need to be addressed and the system measures need to be addressed, whether it's better recognition in the planning system and the planning hierarchy the economic strategies, the climate strategies, but fundamentally even the taxation and the fiscal barriers to make it easier for communities to have ownership and control. 
uh, because at the end of the day, these towns belong to the people in the towns. They don't belong to the extractive economy or the absentee landlords. You know, and that is, I think, the sense of frustration that people feel too distant from it. They feel powerless. They feel disempowered in terms of being able to make change. But there has been some progress, and I think we need to take the learning from where we've seen progress and actually take that back to government to start removing the barriers and start to encourage much more of that happening. I'm looking at this from a sort of optimistic view, viewpoint. We're going to have to repopulate our towns more densely. That should be looking at social and affordable and net zero housing, which in turn just brings populations back into the heart of the town. Because perversely, Scotland as a nation of towns hollowed out its town centres over the last 50 or 60 years. We put everything to the edge of town. We then allowed developers to come in and basically tell us what we were getting. And most of Scotland's major towns are basically clone towns. You get the same thing. Now that clone model doesn't work, and the shopping centres aren't working because of online. Uh, so we have to rethink, but we should be rethinking this in a really optimistic and positive way. Think about more affordable housing in the town centre and denser populations around 20 minute neighbourhoods and sustainability. Think about our towns becoming eco towns, you know, with, with sol solar farms on the rooftops, green walls, pop up parks, biodiversity. Think about our ageing demographic and mega towns much more accessible and more attractive for people. Move beyond retail. You know, there is a future beyond retail that brings in mixed use approaches and makes places uh, much more interesting. So I think moving forward, the key is collaboration. I do agree with Leslie that there is a distance between the sort of democracy and the leadership, but that could be fixed reasonably quickly with getting the likes of development trusts and community councils working together at a sort of hyper local level, but fundamentally being facilitated by local government and, and obviously central government as well. The bottom line is, and I'll finish on this point, our town centres are critical in terms of economic, social and environmental infrastructure. They tell the story of Scotland as a nation. They hold our heritage and our culture. So we must do more. We must find ways to actually make them better. Thanks very much, Phil. If I could move on to Emma, whose town should it be? And what are the biggest challenges facing our town centres for the next 10 years? Um, good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for having me on the panel, Siobhan. Um, whose town is it? Well, um, it's everybody's town. It's the people who live there. First and foremost, it's their town. And, and as an owner of assets, New River Road, 28 shopping centres in towns up and down the whole country. Um, and for our, from our perspective, um, we invest in towns um, and we have to be part of that community. We have to engage with the community. We want to engage with the community because without our, our asset, for that asset to be successful, the town has to be successful. So, and the ownership of towns, and I take your point, there's 20% of, um, of property in, in town centres that there's absentee landlords, but that therefore 80% is known. Um, we know who 80%, that's the vast majority of a town centre, we know who owns those assets. And that in itself is an opportunity. So for those for those who are engaged and want to engage, that's what you have to focus on is who is there to do to do something and to make a difference because there are enormous factors that affect the town centre which nobody can control in a small environment. And that's all the economic factors, that's all the technology changes that we're all seeing and experiencing. That's all the demographic changes that are happening and all the infrastructure of our towns and cities and how places are put together. Um, and that's not and that's before we mentioned funding, and that's not only public funding, but private funding and, for, and banks and institutions putting money into town centres. So all those factors are, are significant before you look at a town centre. And from, from New River's perspective, you know, we are we are an investor in retail assets, retail and leisure assets. Um, and historically, town centres have been very much focused on being based on retail, and that's been the principal purpose for people to come into town centres. And what, what COVID has done has very much accelerated a lot of what was happening anyway. So that oversupply issue of, uh, of retail in town centres has only accelerated. And that in itself is an opportunity. And that's the opportunity for us all to work more collaboratively. And that's both the public and the private sector because both have a huge part to play and working with first and foremost the community and the people that live there to understand what are the drivers of the need of the people that actually live there. And we certainly, if we're doing anything that requires a planning consent, obviously we have public consultations. We do constant surveys with our customers to understand what the requirements are. But I think one of the biggest challenges 
is actually making things happen. Because I think there's been so many um, panels and discussions and commentary and press and publications about what, what a town centre needs and how it needs to adapt and change. And I think there's a recognition that there has to be much more mixed use and there has to be much more facilities for living, shopping, enjoying one another's company, engaging and leisure. And all those elements are going to make a town centre successful. But it's actually taking some action that's needed far more than talking about it. And I think that's where we all have to collaborate, work together and come from the bottom up and actually speak to the people that live in these towns who wants to engage and how we actively share the expertise because there's phenomenal expertise in the towns that we operate in and not only from the councils but from retailers and community groups etc and really try and harness that that will because what's what's fallen out from the pandemic is that many people have reacquainted themselves with their town centers um, and that's that's a wonderful thing it's a positive thing they've also taken on the fact that there's there's a responsibility to your local town and for a town to be successful you have to use it and engage in it and be interested in it and that's you know that's that appreciation of all of people in a town and and the the businesses that operate there and to support those businesses has all risen up. So there's an opportunity just now to grab all of that and make change happen. Um, but that takes collaboration and a trust. That's the other element that people have to trust one another um, and the public sector and the private sector have to trust one another to really make things um, change in a, in a town. And certainly from our perspective, ownership um, is, is responsibility because ownership isn't just a, it's a, it's a privilege to be able to own assets in any town, uh, but it comes with that um, is obviously responsibility and accountability. You're accountable to the people in that town. If you've chosen to buy something in that town, you're accountable to them. And certainly at New River, we feel very um, accountable to the people in a town to ensure that we're providing what they need and want. And that's what we have to listen and understand and hopefully deliver on some of that. Thanks, Emma. Yes, totally agree. Uh, can I move on to Mich Michaela, please? Good afternoon, and, and thank you for having me on the panel, Siobhan. Um, <clears throat> I find this whole area quite interesting. I work in East Lothian, and uh, I, I'd like to, to sort of put in um, a, a plea for, for us not to, to consider all towns um, to be complete basket cases. Um, we have some very successful small towns in East Lothian. <clears throat> and Financial Times did a study um, during COVID um, across the whole of the UK, um, looking at where uh, people shopped most locally. Um, and East Lothian came out at the top um, of, of that table across the whole of the UK. Um, and that study was then repeated sometime after um, all the sort of lockdowns and so on ended. Um, and East Lothian still um, came right up in, I think we were in the top five still, uh, for people shopping locally in our area. Now, it's not perfect, um, nothing's perfect, and, 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 and we still have our problems. But I think our towns are providing, um, to, to a fairly large degree, um, quite a lot of what people are looking for. Um, and as a consequence of that, uh, people, people are continuing to use them. And I think it was Phil that made the point that quite, quite a lot of uh, places in Scotland have sort of hollowed out their towns um, and they've become almost exclusively areas for retailing. Um, and retailing is something that takes place during the day. Um, and, and people are starting also to sort of shop more um, online and so on. And that has left this deficit in towns. And I think it's very important. I'm a town planner by profession. Um, and uh, so, you know, town planners have, have thoughts on this. Um, but I think we're going to have to actually try and move it forward in terms of policy um, and, and consider what, what towns are actually for. Because I think a successful town going forward is not just going to be a retail area. If it is, that's not really what people are looking for. Um, people are looking for, for, for towns to provide much more. Um, and I think that our towns need a complexity of urban grain um, of the type that perhaps the more successful small towns um, that have continued uh, to, th to flourish have. Um, and that is um, a town providing, um, you know, places to go and eat and drink, uh, places for recreation, um, you know, uh, places to live, 
and so on. So I think successful towns in the future are going to have much more of a complex urban grain and be mixed uses of residential and retailing and entertainment and restaurants, bars, cafes, all of those things. Um, now, how to actually achieve that is, is a much more difficult thing. Um, and, and, and certainly from our experience in, in East Lothian, not all the buildings are owned by people who, who have any connection um, with East Lothian or, or, or have um, any, you know, even East Lothian um, at, at, at its best interests um, in their ownership. Um, and, you know, I don't have all the answers as to how we deal with that. But we do have, I think, to reimagine our towns um, starting with a sort of planning policy and vision um, and so on and so forth, um, not continuing to have class one retail frontages for great swathes of our town centres and, and, and denying um, the potential of other uses, um, but, but reimagining and bringing those things forward. Um, so I'll, I'll stop at, at that point, um, uh, as I no doubt the, uh, the, the debate will evolve. <laughs> Thanks very much, Michaela. No, I think you're totally right. The town centres are not going to be the retail hubs that they were 30 years ago, and we do have repurpose and different uses such as leisure. If I could just move on to one question, I, I will come to the audience shortly. In Scotland, many high street buildings are owned by the public sector. What more can be done to encourage these bodies to divest or to repurpose, e.g. E town Centre first, financial incentives, housing, economic or climate strategies. If I could start with you, Phil. Yeah, uh, I suppose if, if we go back to 2013 when Malcolm Fraser was uh, undertaking the independent review into town centres, Malcolm visited roughly 100 towns across the country, big, small, urban, rural, island. and. It was fascinating because he, 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 he's, Malcolm's driven by sort of social justice, and he worked out that 40% of the built form was lying fallow. And at that point in time, we had about 35,000 people who were homeless. And Malcolm just said, "Look, even if we just started to join up the spaces above shops, the public sector ownership. Now, I'm not talking about just local authorities, but if you added up what the health boards had." what police and fire had, and they all tended to be decanting and moving out to a shiny big hospital in a field in the middle of nowhere, which depended on people having a car to get to. And he was saying, why don't we actually just bring this all back into the centre again for sustainability, for community? So there is a massive amount of public ownership across Scotland, disproportionate to the rest of the UK. If you look at the agencies and the likes of DWP and all of the public sector, you will find that they've got a large footprint. So they must start working together at that level of honesty. What is going to be disinvested? Can we work more collaboratively, collaboratively in terms of hubs that service the, the, the public more widely? But fundamentally, they need to come up with political prerogative. They need to come up with a plan. They need to engage the community with that plan. They need to engage investors with the plan, and then they need to start to deliver it. I think there's an anxiety about where do, where do we start. The starting point is that conversation about what do our citizens need and what would make our town more um, vibrant and successful. And the public estate can play a big role in that, whether that is uh, selling it on to commercial investment or house builders or to, to, for social housing or whatever, that will all form part of the plan. But I think local authorities and the public sector have got a massive stake to play because they own so much of our town centres. A really, really large chunk of our town centres is actually within the public ownership. And with the move to try and work more smartly post-COVID, probably more agilely, a lot of that uh, a lot of that stock is actually going to be surplus to requirements, so it gives another big opportunity in terms of how uh, that could be used as an economic stimulus for the town. But start off with the conversation, get some political leadership and prioritisation, engage the community throughout, talk to the commercial investors as well, deliver the plan. It's taken us 60 years to wreck some of our towns. It'll take a good 20 years to fix them. So, but we, we we have to just move forward positively, and I think there's a big big role for local authorities and the wider public sector to play in that. Thanks, Phil. Can I bring in Leslie, please? Actually, I'm sort of completely shocked to hear how much um, you know. I, I I must have somehow missed that key finding from Malcolm's excellent report. But that that kind of idea that 
40% of the built form is sitting fallow and presumably owned by the public sector in our towns in Scotland is really quite shocking. Um, I mean, there are problems with all sorts of other uh, forms of ownership there as well, but it's almost kind of who knew? I mean, it probably did, did take Malcolm some time to actually work his way through. This is uh, common <clears throat> to every attempt to try to map who owns bits of Scotland. Um, of course, more attention has been paid to the rural landscape and the large ownership of by large sporting estates. But this question of who owns the, the town centres and what's sitting there is pretty key. I mean, I would love to think that there was some way to get some civic um, energy to channel some energy into that and effectively have a citizens' assembly in every town to just hear what there is available and try to kind of move in some way on the place plans that are meant to be happening, but which I don't know if they're able to tackle this level of stuff sitting kind of in abeyance. I was going to mention, having having just heard, uh, I think, from Michaela about um, East Lothian, um, I was a couple of years ago at the very excellent um, place in Dunbar, which is a reuse hub, um, and that actually arose uh, from from the onerous leases, which is another cute thing that goes on. I had not heard about this until I spoke to them, but the zero waste hub in Dunbar exists because it's in what was an old supermarket that was bought by a rival, closed down deliberately so as to not create um, competition for their supermarket, and was sitting there unusable. There was no bid that was ever going to be successful if it was going to be another supermarket. But when a, when a social enterprise walked in, that would do OK, actually, because that wasn't going to in any way harm their business. And if that's what we're down to, really, in the way that we can try to map and plan our way through towns, it is a, a really difficult situation. And just the final little thought is, a lot of people will think that solutions, and I think it, maybe it was Phil was touching on the difficulties that are facing communities going in and buying stuff. I mean, the main difficulty is, that, and I, I was noticing this actually in one of the, the, the chats that's coming up, I think it was John Murray who was pointing out, that actually all these community enterprises are volunteers. <laughs> you know, they're, they're actually pouring their lives into doing stuff. They're also ending up having to make annual applications for grants. Uh, to what? Take on an asset that's going to be there forever. I, I'm sorry to be like Mrs. Gloom personified here, but we have not got um, a match really between what we've got in terms of readies sitting in town centres, existing buildings and spaces, and the, the kind of um, availability of that land to do things with actively. And I would love to think people power might be something that could begin to un unleash it all. Thanks, Leslie. If I could just bring in Michaela on this point on how do we encourage these bodies to divest or repurpose from a local authority point of view? Certainly. Um, we have um, a project running at the moment where um, we have some town centre buildings, some of which have, have fallen into disrepair and, and, and are not um, in, in, in active use um, because the previous uses have been moved to newer uh, premises. Um, so we have a project at the moment looking at, at replacing um, quite a large part of what's actually one of our town centres, bearing in mind that our town centres are quite small. We're not City of Edinburgh here. Um, but uh, but we're, we're um, looking to, to, to do exactly what everybody's saying and to repurpose those buildings for um, affordable housing and some additional retail, um, pocket park and, and, and so on and so forth. Um, and, and I noticed somebody put in the chat um, that uh, local authorities need some um, commercially minded folk. Um, and uh, having come from the house building industry, um, I'd like to, uh, to, to, to put a claim in for being a commercially minded person. Um, and, uh, and I don't think that I am alone. I think in, in many local authorities, there are um, commercially minded folk um, and, and these projects are starting to happen um, as, as we look at you know, what our town centres are going to be in the future. And I think uh, Phil's rightly said it's taken a long time um, for our town centres to perhaps decline um, in some places to the point um, where it becomes urgent that something needs to be done. And therefore, it will take time 
you know, with all, all these things, with any uh, property development, um, you know, you have to go through the consenting processes, you have to consult people, um, you have to build a consensus, um, and you have to come up with something um, where the rent you'll achieve when you've finished pays the debt that you borrowed in order to be able to build it in the first place. And that commercial reality doesn't really go away. Um, and it's true for, for, for local authorities um, wanting to develop as, as, as well as everybody else. Um, so I think these things are starting to happen. Uh, maybe they could happen quicker or better. Um, and, and perhaps having these debates is important in, in highlighting those sorts of things. Um, but uh, I think it's, it's a little bit of a watch this space. Um, that there are challenges um, that, that may be overcome. Um, there's also, I think, quite an important issue, and I think a couple of people have touched on it, about around um, the upper floors. Retail uh, in, in the past has been um, a, a, a reasonably lucrative, um, you know, as, as, as a, a, a rental proposition. Um, and the upper floors of buildings have often just been used for storage um, or, or indeed not at all. Um, and I quite recently went into um, the upper floors, um, upper ladder um, of, of a very complex building in Dunbar, um, which has been mentioned, where the ground floor had been turned into a shop what must be many, many decades ago, um, and nobody had entered. They they blocked off the route to the upper floors, and nobody had entered the upper floors in 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 literally decades. Um, so it's quite fascinating because um, this is not a, a council project. It's a uh, um, uh, the the ridge, um, which is a, a a a sort of employment trust that um, trains people in traditional um, construction skills and so on. And the ridge are now looking um, to redevelop that building um, and, uh, and 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 use the upper floors. So so there are examples like that, um, and and things that I think we can do to change our town centres. Um, it's not always going to be easy, and that's as 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 I mentioned earlier, and I think other people have touched on the fact that there are um, absent landlords who, who have bought uh, property for completely different reasons um, from those who, who, who live in the town centre uh, would like them to own it for. Thanks very much, Michaela. I am conscious of time, and I did want to bring in some questions um, from the audience. And I'll, I'll go to you, Emma, first, but the question is from Flo Cairns in Portobello. Here in Portobello, we have a disproportionate a number of fast food restaurants on the high street. Talking with the local planner, there is no mechanism for the citizen to influence the makeup of the high street. Can I please know your thoughts on this? Um, I, I, mean, I agree. I think it's um, it's a, a perennial problem, isn't it? Is getting the tenant mix right, um, particularly when the ownership is disparate. Um, and certainly, as, a, as an owner of you know, shopping centres, we have far greater um, oversight and control, obviously, of who we let shops to, and we try and get the balance right. But high streets um, it, are, are don't have that don't have that oversight and have that privilege that uh, an owner of a whole asset has. But from the public's perspective, I guess it's engaging with uh, any planning applications that are in. There is an opportunity to object to any planning applications, and it's just being mindful of that and keeping an eye on 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 a, on a planning portal. Um, not everybody's notified. There's still neighbourhood notification goes in if there's a planning application, um, but that's one of the um, you know, one of the one of the routes is to. To, to go looking for it, to go and to, to, to go and engage, um, and again, usually there's notices on on lamp posts, etc. If there is a planning consent um, in the process of being um, being considered, um, but again, it's, it's 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 from a council's perspective who are granting those planning consents um, that they also have the they really have the control as to what happens in that town centre, and that goes back again to really understanding the needs of the community and the wants of the community and the opportunity to engage um, with both the public and the private sector and first, first and foremost, the people that live there to influence what actually happens. Thanks, Emma. Phil, did you want to come in on this question? Yeah, briefly, it's just to back up what Emma has said. I mean, where you've got really highly functioning sort of collaboration around town teams, bids, councils working closely together, um, really uh, applications should be notified. So the team should be made aware of what's coming. And we have to just consider wider societal issues, you know, around health and well being. We don't want proliferation of things that could potentially be harmful. But we also want to get the mix right for the place. So um again, get your plan in place, stick to it, um and, and, and try to manage that in the longer term. But the, the, the planning process should be able to allow 
people to influence that in terms of objecting or raising concerns through groups, etc. Thanks very much, Phil. I'll move to the next question. Um, Leslie, the Graham from near Helensburgh. What do the panel think about the Scottish Government sponsoring, say, 10 big ticket events each year for which towns could bid for to stage? The intention would be that there would be a legacy from this event. As an example, I'm thinking of the one really big annual ticket, which would be the annual housing expo, similar to the to the highly successful Finnish Expo, it attracts over 100,000 visitors in the month of August. Yeah, um, is that for me, Siobhan? Yes, yes, Leslie. Yeah. Um, yes, I'm actually just about to go over to Finland to see one of their um, their expos this year, and they move it around a town every year. They've been doing it for decades. They have a bit of built uh, new ideas about house building. It lets everyone come and see stuff, not just in sort of theory, but in actual practice. Um, and it leaves a legacy then of new homes for each new town it moves around. It's brilliant, utterly brilliant. Now, at the risk of sounding like a broken record, but I will move on, um, I merely note that in terms of the number of councils that exist in Finland, there are 309. So, Scotland, 30. So, one of the reasons that this works in Finland is because you have a town council to engage with. You have somebody who's really going to take it on and run with it. And that is one of the reasons that all these places find it easier to skip around and do stuff like this without getting bogged down with, as Phil said, you've got massive councils. If there's going to be someone that's, you know, a fair that's coming to your council, you end up wasting time with every town in the council arguing about it's going to be their gig. Um, so that's one of the issues of what will actually stop that kind of thing happening. I just briefly wanted to kind of comment a wee bit on the previous thing about this question of um, people having, you know, uses of, of high streets and, in fact, crucial bits of, of land in their towns, which are being used for, for things they regard as already overserved. And, in fact, someone who's, I think, in this meeting um, but hasn't put in a question yet got in touch with me before this event to talk about a problem they've got in Banff. Well, they've got an area, Canal Park. It's home to quite a lot of uh, kind of football teams, including the famous uh, Deveron Vale County FC, which my dad used to support. Um, this being estimated, that contributes 1.75 million annually to the local economy. The local area, it's not even a council, obviously. It's in the massive Aberdeenshire Council. But the Banff and Buchan area has decided to, despite the fact that locals were two to one against this, to sell the land to Morrison's. Now, Morrison's, in the meantime, um, has actually been taken over by what looks like, well, in the words of the Guardian, uh, a company which is uh, which focuses on debt gymnastics and property deals. So this is still in the process of going through. Um, it's going to obliterate a bit of green space. There are 770 kids that use that football pitch. I mean, you could go on and on and on about how much this is useful. And meanwhile, Macduff, the neighbouring town, has just given planning permission for Aldi to set up a, a store. Now, nobody thinks this is a good idea, and nobody can stop this. It's actually being built on common good land. Historically, this is land that ought to belong to the people. And yet, councils have just decided that's them these days. So they're about to go to the court of session. At some date, they will not tell local people, so they can't actually find out what's happening. Um, they can put in their objections, and it, they can't afford a lawyer to go and argue on their behalf, actually, at the court event. But I would guess that this will be nodded through, and people will say, ah, well, the council needs the money, and what else can you do with it? And I would also guess this is happening all over Scotland. So it's just it it's not good enough, and yet all the all the tools are stacked against these folk have done all the right things in terms of notification, putting in their submissions, putting in their arguments, getting even getting the costing of if it, if it comes down to money, how much that football team and all the different stuff is contributing, and it means zip. Thanks, Leslie. I'm going to move on to the ne next question, and I, th I think I'll give it to you, Michaela. Um, it's from Ronnie in Dumfries. Why do so many businesses move out of towns, and what can be done to reverse the trend? I, quite a number of um, 
retailers, I think, have, have sort of moved to the outskirts because people are, and, and you know, notwithstanding some of the comments that have been made here, I think people are looking for choice um, <clears throat> in terms of where they shop. And they are looking um, quite often to the kind of larger retailers, particularly in the current climate, um, where um, people are looking for cheaper food um, when, you know, households are challenged um, and energy prices are rising and so on and so forth. So, so there are issues uh, uh, around the way people want to shop um, and, and the type of shopping that people are actually looking for. Um, and, and, and how that plays out in a balance um, with what can then fill what were the shopping areas in the town centres. So I, I don't think we can, we can almost halt a, a, a particular tide um, if, if people are voting with their feet. If, if nobody went to out of town retailers, people would have stopped building them. So I don't think we should try and stop necessarily retailers who, who sell, um, you know, the, 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 the sort of basic goods from moving to the outskirts of towns where it's perhaps more accessible. But what we then need to do is to reimagine what was left behind and make sure that what we actually put in place is somewhere that's desirable, um, that people want to go. Um, and, and that comes down to um, a, a combination of things, policy, imagination, um, you know, how we engage landlords and I you know I don't have all the answers to that I don't profess to have all the answers to that and perhaps also getting uh, people more engaged in terms of of, of the planning of, of of their town centers it does surprise me people put in objections to planning applications um, so people are motivated and interested in planning at the point where they can put in an objection to a planning application very few people actually engage with the plan and applications have to be determined in accordance with the plan. That's what the law says. So I think where uh, there's a deficit at the moment is allowing people to, 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 to see the point, if you like, of planning um, and to come forward um, at the time when decisions are being made about places. And there's a new provision in the 2019 Planning Act that does allow communities to prepare their own local place plans um, and for those to then feed into the kind of wider planning system. Um, and, you know, I'm very much hoping that people will engage with that um, in, in our area um, and, and let us know what they do want. But, you know, there are there's a lot of complexity about this, about who owns what. Um, and, uh, and what can be brought forward. And in the area that I live personally, there are quite a number of coffee shops. And when a, an application went in for a new coffee shop, the local Facebook page was full of armchair commentators telling us that we don't need another coffee shop. But at the end of the day, that's somebody's idea, that's somebody's capital, that's somebody's investment, it's somebody's business, somebody's livelihood. And, 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 and said coffee shop appears to have um, quite a large number of customers. So it's it's very easy for people to sit on the side and say, this is what we don't want. But but actually, when people do bring businesses forward in town centres, if they are frequented uh, by the local population, then it suggests that it is filling a need and is providing what somebody wants. So it, there's, there, there are no right answers here. Um, and what I do think is that we have to be imaginative we have to look at our town centres and say, what can this be in order that people will use it um, on a 24-7 basis? And that is more than just retailing. It's about all the other things that I think make up a, a successful urban place. And you can look at you know, successful urban villages um, that form part of towns. You look at somewhere like Stockbridge, you know, there's no problem. There are probably a few voids, but, you know, there's no problem um, in, in those places. There are people living there, there are restaurants, there are cafes, there are bars, there are, um, you know, Sainsbury's Local or whatever, those sort of smaller uh, retail outlets. So you can create these successful places. And, and some of those, I would say, a similar uh, vibe exists in, in some of our smaller town centres in East Lothian um, that people people are proud of and, and, and feel are successful. So, that's that's the challenge for us all to to think about 
what we want our town centres to be in the future, how through policy we can drive that, and how through you know other means, and, and some of those are really quite complicated, and you know whether you get into um, you know uh, government-backed schemes to, uh, to 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 buy out owners who who are absent and not interested, or you know those those things are always really complex, um, but there, there there are some challenges there, really big challenges. Thank you, Michaela. We just have to move, and I am conscious of time. The last question that we have is from Scott. I live and I work in the Loch Lomond and Trossachs National Park. A significant number of our villages and towns have what on the surface would seem to be vibrant, dynamic and well-occupied centres, but this is largely focused on tourism and, and needs lots of tourists. Um, this this means many locals still have to travel to larger urban centres for everyday needs. What are the panel's thoughts on the role of tourism in town centres? And Phil, can I take this to you? Well, given I'm sitting in Oban, which has just doubled its population since the start of the season, um, it's pretty relevant. Um, I can understand Loch Lomond and Trossachs is going to be very much dominated by um, visitors and a lot of how the centres are shaped up will be to serve as a visitor. I think there's important learning in that. Large, for example, typical seaside town, there was a real agitation from the population that they were actually losing control. And again, the ownership piece came in. Why are we giving our town away to people coming down from Glasgow at the weekend to get drunk or to have fish and chips or to go to Nardini's, when in reality, a lot of the town isn't working for us as a sort of fairly wealthy ageing demographic? So I think there just has to be a conversation about a decent balance. A lot more people are working agilely, and they will demand a change in what's on their doorstep in terms of, you know, being able to provide for their everyday needs. That's an opportunity. Uh, the season in Scotland is predominantly quite short, and this is going to be sort of spring through to autumn. And then these villages tend to get cold and empty during the winter. So someone with a bit of imagination can look at how to extend the shoulder, but make sure there's just decent provision for. The, the, the core residents, the people who live in these towns, not just the people who come and visit them. And that's maybe going back to the question from the chap from Helensburg about you know the big expo events. I'm I'm with Leslie. I think there's some really good innovations that could happen with that. But I would beg the question. You know, you go to Helensburg. It's a beautiful town. You've got um, a sort of reinvestment of Cahoon Square. There's lots of markets and and, and local produce that are produced and are showcased and sold in, the, in, in the, those areas, why don't you put on more local things You know, to celebrate your own local culture, get your various community groups to organise and to get people into the town? Helensburg's community cinema has 16,000 members. Yeah. Those people come in towards the cinema, give them things to do when they're in the town. You know, Take ownership. Don't wait for the big man to come and fix it, because he's not coming. Do it yourself. In open, the guys next, in the office next to me are planning open live. There will be 10,000 people visiting them. They've already done the Sea Shanty Festival. They're in the middle of thinking about the Highland Games at the weekend. Every single week, there's something happening, driven, designed, and delivered by the local community. So, yes, I do think that we can enliven our town centres with markets and festivals and events and concerts and performance, but that should be just local people taking the ownership and doing it themselves. And once in a while, the big expo thing comes and lands. But by and large, you can drive a lot of energy and happiness and fun by just getting off your backside and doing it yourself. Thank you, Phil. Um, I, we are probably about 10 minutes late, um, 10, 10 minutes left, and I'd like to thank everyone for all these contributions. We are not going to get to every question that is in the chat, unfortunately. But before we close, I'd like to give each of our panellists one minute to sum up, and I think what we might do is if we could take it from Mike, who has put the question is, what is the first concrete step to get towards where we want to be? And can we start with Leslie, please? Short of, short of actually trying to get to a stage where we actually have towns that run themselves again. And honestly, I think that's what we've got to do uh, because everything else here is still fighting the fact that control, ownership, and everything else is sitting out with the town. And you know you're always on the back foot when you get that into that situation. Um, there has to, uh, of course, every time you suggest a meantime solution, you end up because Scotland has a great proclivity, and I'm sorry, Siobhan, but this government also does for the kind of 
just managing to keep hurtling along type solutions that don't fix many of these problems, but trying to get people together into um, well publicized citizens assemblies. I hear that there's place plans, there's all sorts of inputs, but you'd really need to win back the trust of people because there's any number of community councils that have done this kind of work been ignored. People who have had little campaigns over areas that I mentioned in Banff, for example, have gone forward, been ignored. Every time they're ignored, you've lost the trust of those people and they won't get involved in the next well-meaning sounding thing that sounds like just another way to tick a box. Thanks, Leslie. Emma, can I bring you in, please? Um, I think I mean, the one, the most important thing is the collaboration piece between all the parties um, at every level. And as Leslie said, the local community are, are the, the starting point of that, and actually listening to what people want and need. But the other big influence is obviously funding, and that's whether that's government funding or private funding. There has to be a commercial angle to to make things happen, and for the public sector or the private sector to invest, um, needs needs funding, and it needs to be commercially sensible. So that, that, that whole piece is very much part of actually affecting any positive change and also to be able to educate one another and learn from one another. And I think that's, um, you know, that's, it goes back to the collaboration of sitting and understanding what are the drivers of all the parties in that, in that equation to make, to make something happen. Um, and certainly, you know, we're happy to be as open because we, we need to be about with, with numbers on anything to be able to show this is what we can what we can do this is how we'll invest and this is how we can continue to deliver to our shareholders and likewise from a council understanding what the, what drives them and then the people what what they actually want because without understanding what anybody wants um no change will be will be meaningful and have sustainability because for it to have a long term success it has to actually be ticking a box and delivering what people want that lives there. Thanks, Emma. I totally agree with the collaboration. Being an ex-councillor, I was continually frustrated that um, politics got in the way of a lot of progress in our town yep. centres. And I move on to Michaela. Thank you. Um, I think, um, as, as, as Emma has said, uh, collaboration um, between um, a wide number of, of actors um, who, who have an influence on these things is very important. And I think also just starting to form a vision of what town centres are going to be in the future um, and, and, and to stop perhaps sometimes clinging to, 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 to the past um, and look to see, well, what, what do we want to achieve? What do people want here? Um, and then from that, there's, there's the complexity around land ownership and investment and so on and so forth and how you get to the point um, where people find um, in their town centre, what, what what they want to find there, um, and th those challenges are not um, they're not easy. They don't have a simple answer, um, but unless we start and unless we try, um, things aren't going to change, um, and we're just going to end up with boarded up shops with to let signs. Thanks, Michaela and Phil. Can I finish with you, please? Phil, can you hear me? I don't think we've got Phil. I think we've lost Phil unless he can come back. I don't think he can hear. I'm going to give him a, a wave, and, but no. Okay. So we 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 must end there. Um, I'd like to thank everyone for coming along today and making such a big contribution. I'd also like to thank our panel: Leslie Riddick, Phil Prentice, Emma McKenzie, and Michaela Sullivan for for leading such a, an insightful discussion. Let me also thank my colleagues in the cross-party group on towns and town centres for bringing this event together and also for the Parliament staff for running it behind the scenes. And can I take this opportunity to remind you that there are two more online events taking place as part of this festival, which is Disability and the Future of Work, which starts at 3 p.m. today, and The Climate Crisis Hasn't Gone Away, which runs between 12 and 1 p.m. tomorrow. There are also events in the Scottish Parliament building if you are able to join us in person. And for full information and to book your ticket, please visit www.festivalofpolitics.scot. That again concludes our event today and thank you very much. I'm just going to see, Phil, can you hear me? You're muted. Good technical problems, Phil. Okay. All right. Thank you very much, everybody.